Now, we are living in some day. My, my, my. The things that we see in here today uh, on a normal week would have made our great-grandparents faint. Uh, they'd turn over in their grave if they saw the way the world is today. And if you don't keep your Bible, if you don't read your Bible and pray, you can't think straight. Your thinking starts getting off the way the world is. I'm going to bring you a little truth this morning that I, I about bet you some of y'all have never even thought of. And it's a word in the Bible that I've never preached on, never heard nobody preach on it. But it, every time I read it, it gets me. So I'm going to do it this morning. Second Chronicles. I'm going to tell you about a king here by the name of Josiah. And then I'm going to read some scripture. Josiah began, he was a good king. You know, some of them kings were bad. And then it'd say he, he did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. And then somebody else took over and he did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. And somebody else took over and he did that which is good. About one out of eight or nine would be a good king. And most of them were just full of the devil. That's about the way it is with rulers and leaders and stuff like that. But Josiah was really, a really good king. But he made a mistake. Uh, when he was only eight years old, he began to reign. People say, do you really believe that? Yes, sir. Just like today, they inherit uh, Prince William and Harry and all them. They're called that even though they're not really in charge of everything. 31 years, he reigned. He did what was right. He began to seek the Lord at 16. Hear all that, teenagers? You don't have to be old, like 25 and 28 and 9, to seek God. That's what, that's what young people think. They think. I remember when I used to think 18-year-old boys on the school bus was old. I'd sit there and I was a little kid and them big old boys would get on the bus and they'd come back to there putting their hands on top of that bus and I'd go, wow, that's some old dudes right there. And, and I couldn't do that until I was about 17, reached the top of the bus. And, uh, but anyway, he was, he was 26. And when he, began, when he was 26, he began to prepare, repair the house of the Lord. They had a great revival uh, in chapter 34 and verse 33. But he made a mistake, and this is a mistake you and I don't want to make. Let's read about it. Second Chronicles 35 and verse number 19. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. Now watch this mistake this boy makes. And after, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. All right, so the king of Egypt comes out to fight against this guy, this other king, and Josiah says, hey, you ain't got no business doing that. And he went out to fight against him. But, 21, but he, this is Nico or Nacho, <laughs> you say, uh, sent messenger ambassadors to him saying, what have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Now hold your finger there. The king of Egypt said, Man, what are you doing coming out here fighting me? I'm, God told me to go over here and fight this guy, and you're over here fighting me. What are you doing this for? Now, look what he said. Verse 22. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him. He wouldn't listen, and he hearkened not to the words of Necho from the mouth of God. That old boy was right with God, and Josiah was fighting against him. You better be careful that just because you've had a lot of victories in life, and, and you're spiritual, and you know it all and everything, you better watch it. There might come a time when you'll be fighting against God and don't even realize it. You've got to be careful about stuff like that. Don't get too big for your britches. And the archers, verse 23, shot at King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. He got shot. You know why? God wasn't protecting him. You know why God wasn't protecting him? Because he's fighting the wrong people. You, listen, the only reason I'm here today is God's hand is protecting me. The devil would kill me today if God's hand wasn't protecting me. And if I do wrong and I'd get him out here and do something wrong, he'll pull that protecting hand back and I get in trouble. And so will you. When he was right, 
God's hand was on him. When he was wrong, God pulled his hand back. Now watch what happens. Verse 24, his servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had and they brought him to Jerusalem and he died. Good night, man. He died for this and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Look how sad it was at his funeral. Jeremiah lamented for Josiah and all the singing men and singing women, the choir, singing men and singing women, spake of Josiah in their lamentation to this day. My goodness, think about that. All these men and women got together and they wrote songs. I can't imagine what they sung. I, Josiah, 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 Josiah. Right? Uh, you should have never went and fought that king. Josiah, the singing men and the singing women. Dolly wrote that one. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the singing men and singing women. Son, Josiah, you messed up, boy. Man, you should have never done that. It's so sad. Josiah, Josiah, that's done got on my mind now. I'll sing it all day long. Uh, but anyway, uh, they, you know what they done? They sung about him, and he died. Now, the rest of the acts of Josiah in verse 26, and his goodness, according to that which was done, he done good all his life till now, was written in the law of the Lord, and his deeds first and last, Behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Now, back to verse 21, my text this morning, and I'll bring the message. He sent ambassadors to him. He said, why are you out here fighting me? He said, I'm not fighting with you. My war ain't with you. It's with these guys. I ain't got no problem with you. Why are you fighting with me? And God commanded me to do this. Look at verse 21, the bottom part. Forbear thee from meddling with God. That's what I want to preach on this morning. Meddling with God. I was reading that the other day, and man, that got a hold of me. Meddling with God. I thought, meddling with God. And, and I looked up the word meddle, and it means just exactly what Josiah did. These two guys was fighting, and he went down there and said, hey, you leave him alone. Bam! Started shooting him, shooting him, shooting him, meddling. The word meddle is a nice way of saying, you want me to put it in good old country, redneck language like me and you talk? It means sticking your nose in something that ain't none of your business. Got that? <laughs> Can we all understand that? Nod your head. Huh? Don't sit there and act like you're some big shot. Uh, uh, you, we, all, we all have known people and all have done it at one time or another, stuck our nose where it did not belong. And Josiah did that. Listen, the world would be a lot better place if everybody would mind their own business, wouldn't it? Amen? But anyway, uh, Josiah meddled with God, the Bible said. He meddled with God. And I thought, how? I began to think about that. And I got, I got three things I want to say about it this morning. And I want you to give me attention and, and we'll go. Come back tonight because uh, you don't want to miss that tonight. All right? The first thing I want to say about meddling with God is don't meddle with God's ways. When I, when, I was, when I was growing up, my mom taught me it was ingrained in my head that God was on earth, heaven, we're on earth, he's, he's in charge, he's all-knowing, he's all-wise, he don't make mistakes, whatever he does is right, whatever he says is right, whatever he's ever done and will always do will be right, and it's none of our business to try to tell him how to run the universe or how to make the laws or what's right and what's wrong. Don't meddle with God's ways. We're living in a time in America when Americans are really, really, really meddling with God's ways. Uh, the Bible said his ways are not our ways. It says the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways. Uh, I was taught all my life that God, by definition, was God. He's God. You don't tell God what to do. He tells us what to do. You don't tell God uh, where he's made a mistake. Lord in mercy. I, I read somewhere the other day, they said, uh, some uh, atheist said, well, if there was a God, is a God, he sure don't know what he's doing. You know what that guy's doing? He's meddling with something that ain't none of his business. There is a God, and it's none of mine in your business how he made the universe, what he allowed to happen. What he, they said, well, if God's... Uh, one, one man told me this. He said, uh, if God's real, I mean, 
Why did he let my grandmother die? I, I'm mad at him. He didn't do right. I, if, I'm, I'm mad at him. And if you're not careful, you'll get mad at God because something didn't go like you thought it ought to go. And that's where you start getting backslid. Now, when you get like that, it's, it's like coming up here busting your head on the corner of this pulpit right here. You know it's going to hurt you. It ain't going to hurt God at all. You can get mad and shake your fist. They said, oh, uh, oh, uh, Ingersoll, that famous atheist Ingersoll, he was always telling people there wasn't no God, and he said, I'm going to prove there's no God. And a big crowd of people was gathered around. Back in them days, people feared God. He said, I'll prove to everybody there is no God. He said, watch this. And he shook his fist up and said, God, I'll blaspheme you. And he cursed God. And he said, I'll give you five minutes to strike me dead, or we'll know that you're not real. And everybody got quiet, and there was gasp. And, and one minute went by. Two minutes went by. He went laughing. <laughs> oh, where's he at? Five, four more minutes. Where are you at, God? Where are you at? And three, three minutes, two minutes. One, one woman fainted in the crowd. Couldn't stand the suspense. I'm saying, they thought any second, it's coming. Lightning's coming down. Well, you know God, God didn't do that. He just let the time go by. And everybody said, and he said, see that? That proves there is no God. I proved it today. There is no God. And some old wise man, oh, they told about it, and he said, uh, does that gentleman honestly think he can exhaust the patience of Almighty God in five minutes? And uh, what he meant was, he said, listen, uh, that fool's out there trying to prove there is no God. God don't even mess with people like that. I guarantee you one thing, Ingersoll knows there's a God now. You know what he done? He meddled with him. He meddled with it. He stuck his nose where it didn't belong. I learned when I was a little bitty boy that God is in heaven. Me and you are on earth. We are little bitty specks on a little bitty speck on this universe. We didn't make it. We don't make the rules. He's God. Don't meddle with God. Don't meddle with God. You know what evolution is? It's a religion looking for a, a proof text. Evolution is a religion you accept by faith. They never seen, they've never seen something come from nothing. They've never seen the world evolve. It's a religious faith. It's a dogma. And ladies and gentlemen, this morning, they are meddling with God. People say, uh, well, if, if God's real, why did he take my grandma? I don't know why he took your grandma, but I guarantee you one thing, he done right and he knew what he was doing. My sister died with cancer on July the 4th. My dad died with a heart attack in December, six months later. My mom, y'all know what my family's been through. You know the heartaches, you know the trials. And I know some of yours, and I'm telling you, it should never enter our mind one time that God's done us wrong. He's not done us wrong. He's not done you wrong. I, when that man said, well, why'd God take my grandma? You think your grandma's going to live forever? I mean, we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. We all have to die. We're just waiting our turn, right? Amen? Don't meddle with God's ways. He's in charge of when you leave this world and how you leave this world. Respect Him. Don't meddle with His ways. I heard the other day, read something and seen this, and it shocked me, but it's the truth. Here's what our society has done. It is a law right now in the United States of America. It's law right now that an eight-year-old boy can go to school and say, I feel like I'm a girl. It's a law, and the school cannot do one thing. is He can go in the girl's bathroom. He can go to the girls on trips. It's law in this country. That's one of the things Obama and some of they forced down our throats before they left office. And I'm not politicking. Not, I, I, I couldn't care less about it. But I'm telling you this morning, they had told us, and they say, you have to accept it. They say, who are you to tell a boy that he's really not a boy? And who are you to tell a little girl that he's really not a little girl? There's already been problems. There's been men in little girls' restrooms. They've already had problems. And they, because they felt, Lord, have mercy. And all them little redneck hicks from Nebo that I went to school with, every boy in our class would have felt like a girl if you'd have, if you'd have made that rule back then. Amen? Sure they would. I mean, they'd have been on the volleyball team and everything else. And that's where it's coming. But they're, <laughs> they're saying this. Now, now, they're saying transgender. They say if a person feels like they're a guy when they're, when they're 
were supposedly a girl. We have no right to tell them they're not because gender is not biological. It is how you feel and think. Now, me and you believe that God made male and female and that if he made you a male... You will always be a male. You may be a messed up one. You may try to be something else, but you'll always be a male and stand before God as a male. And you can take pills and put on makeup and lipstick and everything else, but inside you are a male. Now, here's what's coming down the pike. Are you ready for this? Here's what's coming down the pike. Transgender, they claim they're the opposite gender uh, than their birth gender because they feel they are trapped in the wrong body. Uh, so this, so you know what's going on now? Already happening. Transracial. You're transracial. There's a lady on TV not long ago who said she was black. She believed she was black. Her birth certificate said white. Her look said white. But she believed she was black. She even got a job and fooled a lot of people, fixed herself up somehow to try to believe she's black and really believe. So who are we to tell her she's not black? You say, but, but she was, uh-uh. It don't matter how they're born. It don't matter what's on the birth certificate. You see where this is going, people? And if I say something about it, oh, I'm a mean, judgmental, hate man. I don't hate nobody. I love everybody. I love everybody. You might have somebody in your family like this. I love you. I love them. I love my family. It's got nothing to do with hate. It's got something to do with what we call common sense. And common sense ain't too common no more. So they're transracial. You can't tell a person you're black or you're white if they feel there's something else. And now they're transabled. Transabled means that I am physically, I could pick up this microphone stand, but I believe I'm disabled. So I don't have to work. (laughs) Who are you to tell me that I'm not disabled? If I believe I'm disabled, oh, you say that'll never, it's already happening. We've opened the door to craziness. We've opened the door to insanity. And by the looks on some of y'all's faces, I'm worried about you. You sit and watch Dr. Phil and The View all day long and desperate whore wives and everything else because you ain't got enough sense to discern what's right and what's wrong, people. You're sitting there saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe he's saying that. I can't believe he's saying that. Any preacher who's got any sense says this. I'm trying to jerk us back on tar- on track, ladies, transabled. Oh boy, transabled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, they said uh, God helps them that help themselves, and the government keeps up the rest of them that won't. Now they are transaged. Transage. There was a full-grown man in his fifties, left his wife and kids, and went to live somewhere like at a daycare or something as a six-year-old girl. And you can't tell him he's not if he believes he is. Now, I know that, but I, I understand. I'm the same way. Some of y'all sitting there thinking, Lord have mercy. This is the country we live in. They're meddling with God. Man, in diapers, brother, sucking a bottle. 50 years, who are you to say he's not? If a man can be a woman because he feels like it, and a white can be black because they feel like it, and a disabled can be uh, get uh, cr- uh, government help just because he can a child be an adult? Can a 16-year-old buy alcohol because he feels 21? Who are you to tell him he can't? They feel like dogs. They feel like dogs and going to doggy care. I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. If not, why not? Ladies and gentlemen, all that happens when we refuse to accept how God made us and what God done. Don't meddle in God's ways. <laughs> Number two, don't meddle with his word. 
Don't meddle with his word. That means sticking your nose somewhere where it ain't got no business being. God did not give us his word to critique. God didn't give us this Bible to find out what's wrong with it and change it. He didn't give us the Bible so we can judge it. He gave us the Bible so it can judge us. Now, you either believe what God said about man or what man said about God. Every time you meet somebody that says, oh, the Bible, that men wrote the Bible, and it's just their opinion. Well, men wrote them, them evolution books you believe in, too, and them history books you believe in, too. It's just which men you follow. We believe men did write the Bible, but they were inspired and moved by the Holy Ghost when he did it, and the other stuff the devil inspired. What well, contradicts this word? You can't, it's, that's what either one of, you're either one or the other. You either believe what God said about man, or you believe what man said about God. My job this morning is to cut, dry everything out here and lay it out so you got to make up your mind whose side you're on. Don't meddle with God. I was also taught when I was a little kid, you don't mess with the Bible. Whatever it says is right. If I go against it, I'm wrong. I can't say, well, it didn't really mean that to justify what I'm doing. It's right, I'm wrong. Put it like this. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. When we go against the Bible, we are meddling with God. In other words, uh, when, when, these, when these professors, and you'd be surprised, preachers right here in Burke County, you might be shocked, who don't even believe in a literal hell anymore. Now, they say, well, it couldn't mean hell. Hell couldn't mean burning forever and ever and ever. So maybe it means the Valley of Hinnom there in Megiddo where they burned the, the local trash and it burned all the time. And that's what Jesus really meant when he was referring to hell. But the Bible said Jesus himself coined the phrase, uh, I fear not him which can kill the body, but after that have no more that can do. But rather fear him that after he hath killed, hath power to destroy the soul in hell. So that means hell. Hell is something that happens after you die. You don't say, uh, you don't say, uh, fear, don't fear them people can just throw you in that fire. You better fear them that can throw you in there after you're dead. That ain't, they don't need to be afraid of something after you're dead. Uh, hell is a place where people go after they die. Like it or not, people, the Bible teaches there's a hell this morning. And people still go there. And it's still hot. I know that's not popular. You'll not hear that preached probably in 2% of the churches in this town this morning. But it's still right. I don't know about you. I ain't messing with it. Whatever it says, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to preach it. And I'm going to leave this world by His grace, believing what that book said. And you'll never hear me correct one word of it by His grace. You ain't going to hear it here. You're not going to come to this church and hear the Bible critique. You might get that in the college over there, but you're not getting it here in the house of God. I'm telling you, here's what they'll say. The eye of a needle. Jesus said that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, we really know that he meant difficult because over in Jerusalem, there was these little bitty gates, and it was called the needle's eye, and the camels had to kneel down and run through. So what do you mean? How many of you ever heard that little story? Raise your hand. Oh, don't that sound good? Don't that sound good? That ain't a bit more what Jesus is talking about than a man in the moon. It's not impossible for those camels to get down and go there. Whatever he's talking about, he said, with men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He meant a needle. Ah. Now some of you done been corrupted by education and you think, well, I've always heard that hell just meant a pit. Hell is a pit, but just because the pit does not mean it's hell. Say amen. That's right, brother. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I'll say he really didn't die on the cross. I mean, he swooned and they put him in the grave and he, he woke back up three days. No, 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 no. In the Bible, he died. He rose again. God put life back into him. It, is, it, it, it really wasn't a, a red sea that opened up. It was just a sea of reeds. That's what they teach in college. It was a sea of reeds, and it was only four inches of deep. Uh, you know, you've heard the story of the old preacher. He got went to a college class, and, they, and a professor got up, and he said, Now the Red Sea parted, and it really wasn't the Red Sea. It was the reed sea. And actually, it was only about four inches deep. And the children of Israel walked through the marshy ground uh, of the Red Sea. And, uh, and that old preacher jumped up and went, 
Woo! Hallelujah is a bigger miracle than I thought. And they said, why is that? And he said, God drowned Pharaoh and his whole army in four inches of water. And I'm telling you, that's, that's what happens when you start messing with the Bible. When you start meddling with the Bible. I tell you what you better do. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. This old book right here is supernatural, people. There ain't no book in the world like that book right there. You better not mess with it. You better not argue with it. You better just straighten up and try to live by it. And while I'm on it, can I say this right quick? All you hear nowadays, people talk about, we need counseling, we need counseling, we need counseling, we need counseling. I am not totally against counseling. Some of it. If it's biblical and Christian-based, and it does mention counseling in the Bible, there's a place for it. But God has this thing set up. Some of you ain't going to like what I'm getting ready to say, but it will not be the first time that I've said stuff people don't like. Look at the comments on the Internet. Lord have mercy. Uh, but I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you right now, the way God has his plan set up is for local churches to meet and meet or the pastor, whoever it is, get up and preach just like I'm doing this morning and 90% of your counseling will be done from the pulpit Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night if you'll be there in your place where you're supposed to be. The preacher will cover it if he preaches that book. Now, don't get me wrong. I sit down and counsel people all the time in my office, special needs and stuff like that. You say, well, my son needs counseling. Best counseling he can get Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night in church. Now, don't give me this stuff of, well, I think we need some little special groups to meet at homes and so we can understand the Bible better and won't even go to church on Wednesday night. I don't want to hear that junk. God, I bet you when we get to heaven, we'll look back and say, God said I had it set up, three counseling sessions a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Get yourself in there, and God will cover what you need, I promise you. Now, here's your problem. You're just like the children of Israel in the wilderness. They got tired of the manna. Same old thing every Sunday night, some Wednesday night, the same old thing. That's what they did in the Bible, and God was giving them that manna every week, and they got tired of it. Be careful that you don't get tired it's the same thing every son. Be careful of that. You better be careful of that. God's giving you something to eat. You better eat it. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. In the Bible, it teaches local church. The Bible teaches local churches. The Bible teaches a pastor. The Bible teaches uh, deacons and Sunday school and all of that stuff. The Bible teaches that we're to train our kids. The Bible teaches that. Be careful that you don't meddle with his word. I'm telling you, if I got disabled and I couldn't preach, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd find this one or some church where they preach the Bible every Sunday and I'd have me and my family in that service every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night and I'd back up everything because I believe God's in the work of the local church. It stood the test of time. It's not the building. It's not the lights. It's that we have met together to worship the Lord and preach his word and honor him. There's something supernatural about what we're doing here this morning. It ain't me. If I died right now, y'all get another preacher and just keep right on going. Might do better. Don't start praying that though. I don't want to go like that. Let God be true. Never learn a liar. Thirdly, and I'll be done. Don't meddle with his will. Don't meddle with his will. Do you know God has a will for your life? And it ain't your business to tell God what you should be doing. Let me give you some scripture. He said, uh, you are bought with a price. You are not your own. Therefore glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. I don't like the way the Lord's done some things in my life, but I have no right to question him. I've got off easy compared to what I should have got. Amen? And you have too. He's punished us less than our iniquities deserve. And I'll tell you something else. You're better off in the jungle in the will of God than sitting in a palace out of the will of God. He loves you. Nobody cares for you like the Lord. He's got your best interest at heart. He wants to help you. He wants to bless you. He wants to work in your life. But you can't say, well, I don't want to do this. I, I know better. I, that's what Jonah did. 
God said, Jonah, go down there and preach. He said, I don't think I should do that. The Lord said, uh, you sure about that? He went down there and wound up where? In the belly of a whale. There's an example of somebody meddling with God's will. He better just say, yes, sir, we are, to, we are to take orders. We're not to give orders. I know people order God. I heard a guy on TV one time, and he said, I command you in Jesus' name. And he's talking to money. I, I command you, money, come in and pay these bills. And I thought, he's talking to money? Can that money hear him? I'm going to command that $20 bill to jump out of your pocket right now. That might hurt, tickle some of you. That, that money can't hear. Money don't have ears. I've even heard people say, if you name it and claim it, God has to do it. Oh, you better watch out talking like that. He don't have to do nothing. Now you know saying said, uh, well, don't you think that God has to do it? He don't have to do nothing. He don't have to do nothing. My job is to submit. My job is to come and say, Lord, I'm a no good sinner. I ought to be in hell right now. And I know it and you know it. And God, if you'll have mercy on me, whatever you say, I'll do it. Whatsoever he saith in you, do it. Don't meddle with his will. If he wants you to be a hard-working man and work a job and provide for your family and be faithful to church and pay your tithes and witness and be a soul winner all your life, good. You don't have to be a movie star. If he wants you to be a hard-working uh, young lady and get married and, and raise a family and be good to your husband and raise your kids and honor God, you don't have to be famous. You don't have to be worldwide. You don't have to be rich. You just serve God where he wants you to, and you'll be all right. You want to be miserable? Fight him all your life. Every kid nowadays, they think they've got to be a celebrity. They say, oh, this picture. Did you see this picture? Oh, that's a good one to meet. Oh, fish lips? Why do you always have to make fish lips on every picture you take? I've never thought of that in my life till just then. Some of you little brats needed that. You're not near as cute as you think you are. Mo the ma magazines would be after you if you're half as cute as you think you are. Fish lips. Won't you, won't you act like you got some sense? It's his will to be in a family. It's God's will for just about everybody to be married. Just about. Rarely God has somebody picked out to remain single. Once in a while. But it's God's will almost, 90, probably 98% of people, it's God's will for them to be married. Raise a family. Go to church, read the Bible, pray. Say, I want something more exciting. That's what they did in the, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness. They got tired of that daily man, and the Lord had to smack them. Listen, if your life ain't nothing but go to church and work hard every day and serve God and do right, and this world never even knows you've been here, you're a success in the sight of the Lord because you did his. Bob Jones Sr. said, the man who's a success in life is the man that finds out what God wants him to do and does it. There's your success. Don't try to be somebody else. You ain't going to be no movie star, and I hope and pray you don't. My girls, uh, two of them's here this morning, and the other, two, the other ones are gone. They'll be here after a while. And, and I told them, I mean, when they was growing up, and I mean, they had people try to take them to, oh, one guy tried to get one of them to go to California and do a magazine shoot and everything else. I said, no! You say, wouldn't you like for them to be famous? No! I don't want the world to look at my girls like they're some prostitute or some pitiful loser like them Kardashians or Britney Spears or, or, or Miley Cyrus or them. I guarantee you, Billy Ray Cyrus, if he had to do over, he'd raise that kid different. I guarantee you. Money and fame and fortune ain't everything, people. Doing God's will is what's important. You serve God and do right. If they don't never know your name, it don't matter. You live right and serve the Lord. Don't meddle. God. You know what atheism is? It's a temper tantrum thrown at God. That's what an atheist is. He's mad. He's mad because God won't do like he thinks he ought to. Why'd he make hell? It ain't fair and all that. It's a temper tantrum thrown at God. Movie stars, all politicians, Brother Derek hit on this in Sunday school, it's not his will that any should perish. God wants every athlete, every basketball player, every football player, every baseball player, every hockey player, 
every volleyball, every sport. God wants every runner. God wants every race car driver. He wants every politician. He wants every senator, every congressman to be saved and know his will. When you meddle with him, you'll have to wind up like Josiah did. I, I, was, I was surprised when I realized that boy lived right all his life and he meddled with God and got in a fight he had no business being in and the Lord killed him for it. That's something. That's something. I made up my mind, I ain't meddling with God. Whatever he does is right. Whatever he gives me, I'll take it and keep my mouth shut. Whatever he says, amen, Lord. Thank you. I deserve worse. Don't meddle with God. Let's stand by our heads for prayer.